I think there needs to be a very detailed backstory to explain this video, so sit down and grab a Kit Kat. I'm taking you on a ride. I have a pretty particular relationship with the Pretty Little Liars franchise, more specifically with the original series. It's a show that everybody knows is kind of bad and it makes little to no sense, but it still holds a very special place in my heart. Like, I'm weirdly attached to it. Most of it is mainly because I had a massive crush on Lucy Hale for like 10 years, but that's besides the point. The reason why I say this is because of this mystical attachment I have for the original series, even though it's kind of terrible, I have always been willing to give a chance to the spin-off shows added to the franchise. I always hold a tiny bit of hope that they're gonna be good, because the initial premise of Pretty Little Liars is brilliant, and I'm just waiting for somebody to use that story mechanic to unlock its full potential. So every time, every time I think to myself, Maybe. Maybe this is the one they will finally get right. Maybe this spin-off will be good. Not a single one of them is good, alright? Not one. I covered Ravenswood, the first spin-off of Pretty Little Liars that came out in 2013. It's one of the worst horror shows ever made, and it was cancelled after only 10 episodes that nobody watched. I also covered Pretty Little Liars The Perfectionist, a sequel series that brought back a couple of characters from the original show. It wasn't as blatantly bad as Ravenswood, but it was incredible incredibly boring and underwhelming, and it was also cancelled after 10 episodes that nobody watched. So what does that leave us with? A successful original series that ruined itself with what is now known as one of the worst finales in TV history, and two disappointing spin-offs that failed and died as soon as they arrived. Wow. So after all that, everyone was forced to face the undeniable truth. Pretty Little Liars is a terrible franchise. We just have to admit it at this point. It's a mediocre property composed for the most part of failed series that desperately try to ride off the wave of one successful show. The second half of which people didn't even like all that much. Marlene King tried to build the franchise and failed repeatedly, so after the cancellation of The Perfectionist, most people were ready to let the Pretty Little Liars universe go to bed. It was done, it had exhausted every bit of hope fans still had, the franchise was dead. But then, an unexpected third party entered the chat. And that unexpected third party was HBO Max. In September of 2020, in the heart of the pandemic, just about a year after The Perfectionist was officially cancelled, Deadline reported that HBO Max was developing a Pretty Little Liars reboot slated to come out in 2022. And when I saw that headline pop out on my phone, I lost my mind. I was actually excited, like unironically. This news genuinely made me ecstatic. I could not believe how stoked I was for two major reasons. Number one, HBO is known to have made some of the greatest shows in the history of television. From The Wire, I May Destroy You, Game of Thrones, forget the ending, The Leftovers, Barry, Big Little Lies, The Sopranos, the list goes on. HBO had a reputation of only releasing top-tier television with very adult themes and world-class writing. So you can only imagine. Having the new PLL on HBO Max was the promise of a darker and more mature take on the story that would truly take its potential to the next level. And I was so ready for that. And number two, this was going to be the first Pretty Little Liars project to be made without Marlene King. That was significant because one of the primary reasons why the PLL universe crashed and burned was Marlene King's writing. She had made a habit of relying on cheap tricks and overbearing romance plot lines to waste time for as long as possible to avoid revealing answers to her mysteries. And that's what her whole model was built around. She had also become known for setting up mysteries without solutions. She would introduce a great setup for a mystery without actually knowing where it was going, and then she would just stall for dozens upon dozens of episodes until her back was against the wall and she had to pull an 
answer out of her ass, most likely in the form of twists that were never really satisfying to audiences because they were full of plot holes. That led to Marlene losing the trust of her own fans and nobody wanted to get invested in her stories anymore because nobody wants to follow a mystery that drags you along for years only to find out there was never a real answer behind the question. The truth is, despite the fact that she did create the original show, Marlene King was clearly the wrong person to be the architect of this franchise, so hearing that someone new was going to take over after 10 years was an extremely exciting idea. It meant reinventing the formula, changing the tone, the narrative, and hopefully unlocking the full potential of Pretty Little Liar's unique concept. This PLL reboot sounded promising, it sounded full of hope, it sounded fresh, and it sounded too good to be true. And unfortunately, it was. Because the new architect of the PLL franchise was going to be none other than Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, the creator and showrunner of Riverdale. I have made a couple of videos where I talk about this man. If you're familiar with my channel, you know that at this point, Roberto is pretty much my own personal nemesis. He has a very questionable history in Hollywood, and most of all, despite the fact that most of his projects have been failures, except for Riverdale, which is the only show out of the four he created that wasn't cancelled within two years, he gets to make anything he wants and grab any property he desires because he is friends with the right people. Basically, on his own, Roberto represents almost everything I hate about Hollywood and the current state of the film industry. Finding out that he was going to be the showrunner of Pretty Little Liars Original Sin was a brutal slap in the face. I could not believe it. It was like swiping a rug from under my feet. Naturally, all the hope I had for this show elevating the Pretty Little Liars name disappeared immediately. But all I had left to do was wait for it to arrive and pray that no red flag would kill my excitement any further. First red flag nine months later, okay? Immediately. And surprisingly, the first red flag had nothing to do with the show itself. It wasn't a casting announcement or anything like that. It didn't even have anything to do with Roberto. No, the first major red flag was HBO Max. See, when they announced the show in 2020, HBO Max had not really ventured in releasing a true catalog of original content yet. All of it was either in development, in production, or delayed due to COVID. But after a few months, they did start releasing original content, especially high-profile properties they were reviving. It was at this moment that he knew he fucked up. So we got the Gossip Girl reboot. That, 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 was a, that was a pretty big red flag. That was painful. And then we got the Sex and the City reboot. Uh, ow. We were doomed, clearly. We were doomed. With these two series, HBO Max had essentially set the tone with a very clear message. They were not interested in quality. They only wanted to capitalize on famous IP, so they took what was available under the Warner Brothers umbrella and just threw some half-assed reboots out there in an attempt to attract viewers to their platform. And following Gossip Girl 2021 and the Sex and the City reboot both getting an overwhelmingly negative reception from fans and critics, I had a feeling that Pretty Little Liars Original Sin was made by HBO Max with that same mentality. There was no chance this show was going to be good. It was dead on arrival. So I waited, and a few weeks ago, the show finally came out. And it is with all the shock in the world that I come here to tell you, Pretty Little Liars Original Sin is amazing. I'm kidding, it's terrible, no one's surprised. I was right, this show ended up being everything I was worried it was gonna be. And it's a shame, because despite having everything going against it, I really wanted to like this show. I wanted nothing more than to hop on this channel and boast about how they finally got it right. And you know, while it is bad, it does do a few things better than its predecessor, and we're gonna talk about that in a bit, but overall, yeah. Original Sin was a huge missed opportunity with an amount of wasted potential I just cannot get over. They completely missed the mark here. So, 
let's break it down together. Oh, and before we get into it, I, I just want to give a bit of a warning. This show deals with some very heavy topics like sexual assault or suicide in a pretty raw way. I'm not going to talk about it too much and I'm going to keep it as tame as I possibly can. But just in case, just so you know, the topic will come up because it's a big part of the show. So, you know, don't, don't hesitate to click away if those topics can create any type of trigger for you. I just, I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, so Pretty Little Liars Original Sin is the story of Imogen Adams, a teenage girl from the small town of Millwood. Imogen lives alone with her mother Davy, and together they try to do their best to get by because Imogen is several months pregnant. One night though, as Imogen is visited by her ex-best friend Karen, Davy receives a mysterious letter containing an old flyer for a rave that took place in the year 1999. She visibly looks horrified by it, and a few moments later, Imogen and Karen find Davy's dead body lying in the bathtub. Davy took her own life, leaving behind her one cryptic message. The letter A written in her blood. A couple months after this tragic incident, Imogen and four other girls in her school suddenly begin to be stalked and harassed by a mysterious man in a mask who sends them threatening texts. At first, they think they can ignore it, but when Imogen's former best friend Karen is murdered by A in the middle of a school dance, things quickly take a really dark turn. The girls now have to stick together to get to the bottom of it, and they realize that everything that is happening is linked to their respective mothers, and it all might have to do with this secret rave that took place in 1999. Okay, as you probably noticed, there is a lot happening with this premise alone. It's kinda messy, and there's a lot to follow, which is rough because the story never truly gets any real sense of focus. Like, the story has somewhat of a trajectory, but it keeps getting distracted by having too many storylines that end up doing nothing for the main plot or the characters, to the point where, after a certain point, the A mystery takes a bit of a backseat until the finale, but okay, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I will say that the opening scene of the show is actually quite solid. It's really intriguing. The show opens during the rave of 1999, and we follow a young girl who arrives at the party in a complete state of distress stress, desperately trying to get some help. But everyone at the party ignores her and acts like they don't see her. Help me. Help me, please. She begs everybody to look at her to no avail, and finally, she tries to get the attention of a group of girls she seems to know, but they ignore her as well. Completely panicked and out of control, the girl then climbs up a wall to make her way above the stage, and she kills herself in front of everybody at the rave. I mean, great opening, loads of interesting questions. What happened? Who is that girl? Why was she so panicked that night? Why did everybody seem to be in on a plan to act like she was invisible? Who hurt her? Why did she kill herself? Who are these girls who seem to have been behind the silence treatment? It's a very effective setup and unfortunately, it's the only great scene in the entire pilot. The first episode of Original Sin is one of the worst pilots I have seen in a really long time. I'm not alone in this, a lot of people have talked about it online, and some of my friends, including Amanda the Jedi, have also shared the sentiment. By the way, Amanda made a video on the show as well, so go watch it, I leave a link in the description. But yeah, I, I kinda just have to reiterate that here. It is such a bad pilot, to the point where, no joke, halfway through, I was pretty positive that I wouldn't finish this show and wouldn't make a video. But HBO Max was smart and released the first three episodes on the same day, so I binged through all of them. The first thing I will say about Original Sin is this. This show just doesn't have the spirit of Pretty Little Liars. It just doesn't fit. In terms of plot alone, this show feels less like Pretty Little Liars and more like a weird horror take on 13 Reasons Why. Because at its core, Original Sin is about solving the mystery that led a young girl to commit suicide back in 1999 as a result of repeated bullying from her classmates, and we follow the main characters as they try to figure out what happened, the same way Clay did in 13 Reasons Why. The only thing that connects this show to PLL is the fact that the 
villain of the story is called A, but even then, this A is very far removed from what the original was like. Like, seriously. Are we just gonna pretend this A isn't just the Black Hood from Riverdale? He's the same killer with the exact same concept. He just wears a different mask and he sends text sometimes. You thought I wouldn't notice you just recycled the killer from season two of Riverdale? Try again, kiddo. You can't fool me, Robbie. I see right through your bullshit. And I will say that despite all of the criticism I have of this show, I actually think Roberto did some aspects of A better than Marlene King ever has. Yes, I will give credit where credit is due. I have a heart. Not everything about this show is bad, and there are elements of its villains that are pretty neat. This A is brutal, darker, he doesn't give a shit about killing, he doesn't sugarcoat things. He has the judge, jury, and executioner element that the original A severely lacked. Hell, this A murders someone in front of the girls just to prove he can do it, and then makes it clear to the girls that he will murder them too if they say anything about him. That is a threat, my guy. The original A never really felt like a threat, it killed once every two or three seasons and all of the crazy threads the girls got via text never really came to fruition. It was an A that, in the grand scheme of things, talked the talk but didn't really walk the walk, if you know what I mean. This new A, however, from the get-go, he means business. He does not fuck around. And this aspect is one where I think Roberto outdid Marlene. He actually made A scary. However, while he made A scarier, Roberto also also undid everything that made A a fun villain. This A, despite being creepy, is boring as shit. Oh my god, he is so bland. And his interactions with the girls are so flat and devoid of any of the wit we got from the original. The original A is sassy, calculated, it taunts you, it fucks with your head. Like it plays the long game, you know what I mean? Or, you know, at least that's what Marlene wanted A to be, even though she never managed to write that well, but whatever. There was a more psychological aspect to A in the original show. That A would really mess your head up, it would get you so paranoid. But this new A... This new A is just Michael Myers, except he sends texts here and there, it's the only difference. And yes, that's intentional, there are scenes in this show that are entirely ripped off from the Halloween movies, literally shot for shot. But just because it's an homage to something doesn't immediately make it good. Because yes, basically, Original Sin prides itself on being a horror take on Pretty Little Liars, which would be great, except for the fact that this show is not really good at horror. It's, it's actually pretty bad. Like, if this was a horror movie that came out in theaters, people would be clowning it online for at least six months. It's not scary at all. But it really seems to think it is. There's no real tension. The writers and directors rely way too much on jump scares and fake out scares to try and spook you. And overall, this show is just not all that scary. The use of jump scares is so constant and random that they become funny after a while. I don't know if it's just me. Maybe like me know in the comments, but cheap jump scares just make me laugh. They're so ridiculous. Like getting jump scares of A standing in the background of a scene watching people gets real old real fast. And just because you throw a loud sound at us every time it cuts to him doesn't make him scary. Chester Prince is forced to wear around her neck for being a There's only one shot that I genuinely thought was great. It happens early into episode four. Anyone there? Uh. 
Like, okay, okay, all right, you got me there. All right, okay, you got me there. That shit was spooky. However, I do think it is completely stupid for pregnant Imogen to try and investigate a suspicious noise on her own in the basement of an abandoned house where her mother died at a time where she knows a serial killer is somewhere out there trying to get her. It makes her character kind of dumb, but that's a writing issue. And as we've established several times on this channel, bad character writing is kind of Roberto's specialty. And and the bad horror is not helped by the fact that Pretty Little Liar's original sin has some truly awkward directing. It's actually kind of awful. And immediately, the first thing I noticed about that is this show is ugly. It looks really bad. It has some of the worst directing choices I've seen in a very long time. And that's kind of surprising coming from a show from Roberto, because the one thing I tend to praise about his shows is the fact that they usually look really good. Like for all the shit I have to say about Riverdale, the aesthetics of the show are pretty solid. Like it looks amazing. Same goes for Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, which had some beautiful shots sprinkled in there. And I know the director of Original Sin has only ever directed a couple of episodes from Chilling Adventures of Sabrina before this, but jeez, it's hard to ignore here. The shots are just plain ugly, the focus play has no real point here. It seems like the director is just trying to flex, but it has the opposite effect. Everything looks really cheap. The color grading makes the show look flat and muddy. The episodes are filled with random Dutch angles. Sometimes the camera just spins for no reason. Like the directing of this show is so weird and distracting. It's like it tries to be quirky, but it's just awkward. It's like the filmmaking equivalent of the phrase, I'm not like other girls. And it's also made worse by the fact that Original Sin has some god awful editing. And I know everybody has talked about it already, so I won't like dwell on it too much, but it is probably the worst editing I've seen in a show since. I don't even know. I don't understand how some of those episodes were final cuts. It genuinely blows my mind. Scenes just end awkwardly. They linger on shots for way too long to the point where it's just cringe. I can close that if you're cold. Crazy Joe, was it? No, thank you. We're good. So what was that? Some moments that are supposed to be shocking just become fucking hilarious because they make the weirdest editing choices. The end of episode one literally had me burst out in laughter because it's just so absurd. We should kill Karen Beasley. By the way, that line is never explained. She just says that at the end of the episode because I guess Roberto thought it would be like a good cliffhanger or something. But then episode two starts and nothing has to do with killing her. It's never brought up again. It's never explained why she said that. Good job, Roberto. You're so good at stories. And the end of episode two is just as funny. They almost had a legitimately scary scene here, but at the last second, they make it utterly ridiculous. the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah, the editing of this show is very amateur-ish. If you told me this show was edited by a nine-year-old in his bedroom, I'd probably believe you. And I know what you're saying right now. Okay, Dylan, Dylan, you're talking and talking about all this stuff. What about the characters and all this, huh? What about the characters? Well, let's talk about the characters. Ooh, you're coming get it, uh, too far, yeah, but I scan it, you know, what's understand it. The characters of Pretty Little Liars Original Sin are not great. <laughs> I mean, it's a Roberto Agrissa Casa show. What did you expect? And to be perfectly honest, it's not necessarily that they're bad. Not all of them, at least. They're all severely flat and underwritten, but they are diverse and some are slightly more likable than others. There are five liars in this reboot. Imogen, Farron, Tabby, Noah, and Mouse. And right off the bat, the main issue I have with these characters is they don't 
actually have much to do with the story. So the show has to wait an incredible amount of time to give them something to do because they're the main characters and they should be doing stuff, but none of it really matters in the grand scheme of things because they don't have anything to do with the main plot. And that's one of the main reasons why Original Sin can never be as engaging as the first show. The main characters are not the main players in their story. Their mothers are. The entire mystery we're trying to solve is about their mom. Moms. It's about stuff that happened before they were even born with characters they mostly don't know and that just doesn't work. The original show deals with the disappearance of the girl's best friend, Allison, who seemed to have a lot of secrets. Arya, Spencer, Hannah, and Emily are all directly linked to the main mystery. They're a part of the equation. They were the last people to see Allison alive before she went missing. Some people, including the police, think they might have had something to do with her disappearance. So in a way, the girls are trying to solve the mystery to save their own asses, potentially save Allison and unmask A, but they also want to solve it to clear their names. And Allison knew things about each and every single one of them that nobody should ever find out about. There's weight to the situation. Sure, parts of the story are external to them because Allison had secrets that extended to everybody in town, but the girls are a primary part of the mystery. They're directly concerned. The new liars, however, are more of a third party walking into a succession of events that entirely took place without them. It's difficult to care about what's unfolding because the girls are not really affected by it. So they're just sort of floating in the story. Imogen is the only one who spends the whole show trying to solve the mysteries. The other girls are mostly off doing other shit that doesn't have any link to the mystery at the center of the show. It's essentially a roster of characters that headline a story they're not really implicated in. It's, it's kind of weird. Imogen is okay. I've seen a lot of people hating on her online. People find her really annoying, but I thought she was fine. I think it's mostly because Bailey Madison is really good in this role. And I like Bailey Madison a lot. She definitely gives the best performance out of everybody in the cast. Her character is written like a complete idiot, which is an issue because, like I just said, she's the only one who is spending the whole show going around trying to solve the mystery. But you can tell by watching that Bailey clearly did her best with what she was given. She's honestly killing it in this role. Imogen is a character that is going through a lot and she experiences a wide range of emotions, and Bailey sells it perfectly every step of the way. However, the big problem problem with Imogen being the main investigator of the show is simply that most of her investigating doesn't actually make sense. An overwhelming amount of it is based on insane stretches or on Imogen making wild assumptions and jumping to conclusions that come out of nowhere in ways that are not very coherent. The writers really want you to see Imogen as this super smart girl, but it just it just doesn't work. Because towards the end of the show, I realized that Imogen didn't do anything. Like, she never actually figured anything out. Let me explain. In episode one, as she goes through her mother's stuff, Imogen suddenly becomes skeptical of one very random pile of papers and randomly picks up one of them. There's nothing special about this piece of paper. She just kind of grabs it for no reason. And that paper just happens to be the flyer of the 1999 rave. And Imogen immediately thinks this flyer is weird. But why? Why would she even pick that up in the first place? Look at how randomly it happens. This is the scene that truly kickstarts the plot of the season with the girls, but it just doesn't make sense. Imogen just finds this flyer in her mom's stuff and she's immediately suspicious of it, but for no real reason? It's just a flyer for a school party she's never heard about that took place 22 years ago. Why on earth would she be suspicious of it? And then why would she simply link the death of a girl in 1999 to the suicide of her mother? She has no reason to do that. She just decides the two deaths are connected based on absolutely nothing and then she just runs with it. It's so dumb. None of her reasoning makes any sense. She's literally just coming to those conclusions because the story needs her to, but the writers don't even try to make it some kind of clever detective work, or at least not in the way they think it comes across. Like Imogen never really puts two and two together. She never figures things out like a detective. She never truly investigates. She just kind of gets guesses whatever the plot needs her to guess without any real lead up to it. This is the chain of events. Imogen picks up a random flyer in her mom's bedroom. She notices it under a bunch of other random
random papers on her desk for no reason and then she immediately becomes suspicious of the flyer for no reason. She then just comes to the conclusion that the suicide of her mother is indisputably connected to the Y2K ray from 1999. Why? No reason, she just says it is. And mind you, that's before she finds out that somebody died at that rave. Then she finds out that a girl named Angela Waters killed herself at the rave, and she goes to visit her memorial, where she just happens to run into Tabby's mom, who is here to pay her respects or something. And based on that alone, Imogen just jumps to the conclusion that her mom must have been responsible for the girl's suicide in 1999, that Tabby's mom was probably in on it, and that it means the moms of all five of the girls are lying to them about something and that everything A is doing has to do with the rave and with their mothers. That's it. No lead up, no reasoning, no logical progression to that thought process, no clues investigated to get to that conclusion, nothing. She just guesses all of that out of nowhere. It's honestly just very lazy writing. Like, you can tell the writers did not give a single fuck about the logic of the show, which is always a pet peeve of mine when the story deals with a mystery that needs to be solved. Like, the least you can do is not treat the audience like morons. And it's not just with Imogen. These writers don't care one bit about the story. There's so many gaps in logic in Original Sin that make it just that much stupider. It's kind of insane. Like, this show breaks its own rules constantly. Constantly. It is not consistent at all. Here's a quick little flash list of things in Pretty Little Liars Original Sin that just don't make any sense. The show makes it very clear that A only kills bullies. That's his thing. That's his code. He only goes after bullies. He does not touch innocent people. He only goes after bullies. Except, no, he doesn't. In episode one, A murders the school's janitor. Why? No reason? The writers thought it would be a cool horror sequence, and I guess they just forgot that he's not supposed to do that, because that goes against his code. It's literally episode one, and your villain is already breaking his one rule. And while we're talking about murders, I was convinced that the janitor being killed in season one was gonna be a big deal. Like it was starting a storyline that would get the police involved or something. And, uh... No. Nobody ever mentions that the janitor just went missing randomly. It's never brought up. Nobody ever looks for him. The school doesn't report that one of their employees hasn't shown up to work in weeks. Nobody cares. It's just completely forgotten about. The same goes for Tyler. Tyler gets murdered by A during the Halloween episode and then nobody cares. No one even notices he's missing. It's mentioned once in passing during a scene with Tabby and Sheriff Beasley and then nothing else happens. His friends don't really care that he's missing. His family doesn't seem to care either. And like weeks go by and nobody ever talks about it. It's just completely forgotten about as well. Also, A kills Karen Beasley in the middle of a school dance in front of everybody. Everyone could see him, but somehow only the five main girls notice him killing her. That's... That's very convenient. Also, also, Imogen's mom, Davy, commits suicide in the first 10 minutes of the show, and Imogen's entire storyline consists of proving that her suicide was not a suicide, but a murder. Then at the end, you find out that Davy did kill herself out of guilt for what happened to Angela Waters 22 years ago. So first of all, what was the point? But also, if Davy did just kill herself, why on earth did she write an A with her blood on the wall? That makes no sense. Based on the entire timeline of the season, Davy shouldn't know that A even exists at the time she dies. That means nothing to her. A wasn't even there yet. Nobody knows about a until the girls start being harassed by him months after Davy's death. Hey man, it's not it's not that hard to make sense, dude. You can, just, you can just try to make sense a little bit, just a little bit, just for one time. Oh, and another massive gap in logic that should be talked about more. Original Sin's big surprise is the confirmation that it takes place in the same universe as the original show, but also in the same universe as Riverdale. Meaning Roberto has now merged the PL universe and the Riverdale universe into one big franchise. Uh, yes, you heard that right. Pretty Little Liars, The Perfectionists, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, Riverdale, etc. They're all taking place in the same timeline. So while Arya, Spencer, Hannah, and Emily were trying to figure out the identity of A, Sabrina was a couple towns over stopping the 
devil from taking over the world. And Cheryl was turning into the Scarlet Witch. But also, you get how that doesn't make sense, right? Because Pretty Little Liars, the show with Arya Montgomery, is now taking place in the same universe as Katie Keene. Do I need to explain it? Anyways, I could nitpick on the show's obnoxious lack of logic for hours, but let's get back to Imogen. You probably noticed I mentioned earlier that Imogen is several months pregnant in this show, but I haven't really talked about that since. Why? Well, it's simple. It's because it doesn't really matter. Imogen being pregnant is completely irrelevant to the story and even more relevant to her character, surprisingly. By that I mean, if you take away the fact that she's pregnant throughout the entire season, nothing in the story actually changes. Basically, we learn later on that Imogen became pregnant as a result of being sexually assaulted after a party and she eventually finds out that Tabby was also sexually assaulted and they realize they were both assaulted by the same guy who turns out to be Tabby's best friend, but Imogen being pregnant doesn't do anything for that storyline to play out the way it did. Around episode 6 or 7, I generally started to ask myself why the writers made the decision to make Imogen pregnant because it seems weirdly out of place and kind of unnecessary. The show doesn't try to explore the struggles of being a teen mom or anything like that. There's just no point to it. Imogen is just there the whole show, being a character who plays a part in the story, but she's just pregnant. It's something about her that's just there and it doesn't do anything. So I was like, this is weird. Where are they going with this? I, di I didn't get it. And then they finally give an answer to that question in the finale. See, the reason why Imogen is pregnant and hold on to your butts because this is not a joke. The reason why Imogen is pregnant is because the writers wanted to set up a potential Arya and Ezra storyline for season two. <laughs> Uh, okay. The big twist of Imogen's pregnancy is that she decides to put her baby up for adoption and Arya and Ezra are going to be the couple that adopts the child. The reason why this twist annoys me is that it is insanely hypocritical. Original Sin is a show that takes a very severe and serious stance against inappropriate age gap relationships. It shoves some not so subtle commentary down your throat almost every episode. It denounces grooming, it denounces the use of power dynamics, adult minor relationships, it never stops. The writers are so self-righteous about it throughout all 10 of these episodes and then they completely undo it by deciding to glorify a relationship of that very nature and refer to it as perfect. Because yes, in case you don't know, Arya and Ezra are a couple from the original PLL and they are messed up. Arya was groomed, manipulated, and abused by Ezra from age 15 when he was her English teacher. And then they became a couple for the entirety of the show and the series finale of Pretty Little Liars takes place on their wedding day. Do I need to explain it further? For a show that is so condescending and preachy, they were pretty quick to drop their so-called values in favor of a potential cameo from iconic characters of the previous series. And this Ezria twist is honestly an insulting end to Imogen's already mediocre storyline. So yeah, Imogen, a bizarrely underwritten character that is only saved by Bailey Madison's performance. She deserves so much better. Better. And when I say that, I mean it both for the actress and the character. And Imogen is one of the better characters in the show. The others don't really elevate anything. Mouse is fine. She's definitely one of the weirdest characters in the show, and she doesn't really contribute to the main storyline. She's mainly off doing her own thing, and she never really becomes a part of the mystery. Her storyline is all about her developing a bizarre relationship with a grown man whose daughter went missing, and so she spends time with him pretending to be his missing daughter? Uh, I... Uh...
Okay. We find out a bit later in the season that she does that because as a kid, she was almost kidnapped by a man or something like that. It's super weird. I'm not sure I understand what the point of that story was. It has absolutely nothing to do with anything going on in the show. It goes on for so long and it never really leads to anything. She finds out the man who tried to kidnap her as a child was her biological father, but her moms tried to hide it from her. And then the man she's been seeing whose daughter was went missing he finds out that his daughter was found dead and then he goes crazy and i just i just i what the hell is going on man the entirety of mouse's storyline is a massive head scratcher i just don't get what they were trying to do with this it's awkward and similar to imogen's pregnancy even if it addresses a very serious topic it's executed in a way that doesn't provide any commentary and it doesn't do anything for the characters involved or for the story as a whole so so why? It's another reason why I compare this show more to 13 Reasons Why rather than Pretty Little Liars. It's obsessed with throwing dark and heavy topics at your face every five minutes, but with no real goal. There's no point to any of it. It's just here as exploitative shock value with no purpose. So yeah, mouse. The character herself is fine, but her entire presence and storyline in this show is just Yikes. Anyway, the next character on the list is Noah. And Noah is pretty cool. I liked her quite a bit. She's probably my favorite of the gang. Her personality is not super consistent. She's a bit all over the place. It's like the writers don't really know what type of character they want her to be. But overall, I think Maya Rafiko is really good in this role. And I say that knowing full well that Noah has absolutely no reason to exist in this show. She does nothing. The whole season, she contributes absolutely nada to the main story. If you take her out of the show completely, the outcome will be the exact same. She has no impact on the plot whatsoever. But I liked her, so I don't want her to go. She's cool as shit. The whole story about her mom being a drug addict is really boring, and it goes nowhere. Same for her boyfriend who is taking steroids or whatever. Again, just heavy topics addressed with no real goal. But I still like Noah. She also has one of the cool scenes in the whole show where she's chased by A in her building and she escapes on the roof. I don't know, that's some cool shit. I mean, the scene doesn't make sense because A only goes after bullies, but Noah isn't one. She's innocent, so why was he chasing her? What was he gonna do to her? Clearly he wasn't gonna kill her because that's against his code, so why chase her like that? It, ma it makes no sense. I don't know. It's weird. But, but I still like Noah. She, she's cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm conflicted because she's genuinely a dope character. She's the only one I got attached to, but she's just so out of place in this show. Noah, her mom, and her boyfriend, they all feel like the main characters of another show, and they just got lost and somehow landed in Original Sin. It's kind of a shame. You know what? Hashtag justice for Noah. Make her the main character next season. She deserves better. I got your back, Noah. Don't worry about it. Tabby is the one character I could not stand. She is by far my least favorite character in the entire show. See, Roberto really likes to write characters that have a lot of knowledge about cinema, whether it be modern or classic, and he likes to force dialogue in their scenes where they make references or discuss films. And it is so tacky and unnatural. Just like Tabby. Oh boy, did she make this show worse for me. No shade to the actress, her performance is probably the weakest out of everyone but like she's not the worst actress i've ever seen it's really just her dialogue man holy shit every single one of her lines is an obnoxious movie reference that has no real point and it is so fucking distracting i already talked about this roberto trope before because he does the same thing with sabrina spellman and veronica lodge but this pll character takes it to the next level. And I'm not above a clever movie reference and dialogue. It can be really fun if it's well done, but Roberto's characters don't work like that. The references this character makes are literally just name dropping movies in every single line of dialogue she gets. And when I say every single line, 
I am not kidding. Tabby gets more lines that name drop movies just for the sake of it than lines where she doesn't, and it feels forced every single time. How long do we have to stay? It's a party, Chip. Give it a chance. Pretend we're at Tom Cruise's party at the end of Risky Business, or at the house party in Almost Famous, or from like the social network, or... This is an Amityville level of weird, right? Like I'm getting some serious poltergeist vibes right now. I saw Karen up in the rafters. So did we. She had, had a bucket. Like in Carrie? And there was someone else up there with her. A man in a mask. He, he pushed her. A mask like from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I didn't think the Beasleys could be more dysfunctional. Seriously. Forget Pet Cemetery. That's some hereditary level shit. I think you should run for Spirit Queen. Oh, God. Come on. <laughs> let's go Tracy Flick on this bitch. Mm. I'm with you. You know that? Thanks, Joe. You're the best. And quid pro quo, Dr. Lecter, I'll owe you. And um, she also took responsibility for trashing the posters. See, female Patrick Bateman. She never would have done what I did, shown that video. No, 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 it wasn't just you. It was all of us. We made a pact, like the Losers Club. Okay, I'm not just suggesting this because After Moonlight, Perks of Being a Wallflower is my favorite boy coming of age movie, but I don't even have a dress that fits. Relax, Lady Bird. If it's about a dress, my mom can help with that. She's a psycho, Mom. Don't call her that. But she is. She's like full jawbreaker. Mr. Hammond, I think we're back in business. Stay in your tabby. Wes, Fincher, Zodiac. Don't. Wait, I think I was at this party randomly, fully trying to be one of those cool kids in that 80s rom-com kind of way. What if we skip the rest of the day and road trip to Rosewood? That one Louis style. Can we hang out after school tomorrow with the girls? A loser's club reunion? I'm down. To quote Chucky. <laughs> Friends till the end. Actually, it's Kiki Ki Ma Ma Ma. As in when Mrs. Voorhees says Killer Mommy in Jason's voice. Betty Lamb, who it turns out was an orderly at the Radley back when it was an insane asylum. What? Okay, Teen Slew. Thank God, because you were incredible. <laughs> no <laughs> joke, you put the entire cast of Center Stage in the shade. Oh my God! Shut up! I found Tabby's character to be insufferable. She spends the entire show just scolding people and giving them shit for their morals. She's incredibly condescending and hypocritical. In fact, when you really take a look at it, a lot of this show is a succession of scenes where the main girls scold everyone around them with that same fucked up moral high ground. They all do it, and that's all the show does for a really long while. But Tabby easily gets it the worst. She spends the whole season just nagging people and being an asshole to everyone. I hate that character with a passion. Farron, along with Noah, is probably the most useless character to the plot, but also one of the more likable ones, I think. She really doesn't have a reason to exist in this story either, so most of her time is wasted on her ballet dancing and eventually a very contrived and senseless conflict with her mother about scoliosis. But 95% of her presence in the show is completely disconnected from A and the mystery around Angela Waters. In fact, Farron says, on more than one occasion that she does not care about A and doesn't want to be involved in that mess. And so she just isn't. We're their daughters. There must be a reason A is targeting us. And the mystery continues. Good luck with that. And there isn't much more to say about her. So yeah, those are the new liars. They're bland and awkward and annoying and for the most part pointless and they perfectly reflect the rest of the cast. All of the characters in Original Sin are just as empty. The main mean girl in this show who's around for the first two episodes is really annoying as a character. Nothing to do with the actress, she's totally fine in the role, but the character is just terrible. She's so one 
note and on the nose as a mean girl. It's really obnoxious. Her name is literally Karen. You can't be more on the nose than that. The issue I have with Karen is that being a meanie is the only mode she's on the whole time she's on the show. It's her one personality trait. I think she's meant to emulate the codes of Alison De Laurentiis from the original show, but it just doesn't work because Roberto just took all of the superficial traits of that character to shove them into Karen without a deeper thought, and it makes the character fall flat. As bad as Marlene King was at character writing, Allison had her layers. She was an asshole, sure. She was a bully, absolutely. She was mean and cruel and vile, but the show made a point at several times to show you that Allison also had a faint capacity for compassion in rare moments. It doesn't make her a good person by any means, I will always stand by my claim that Alison De Laurentiis works best as a villain, but she was not entirely black and white. She wasn't one note, there was an edge there that made the character function. Karen is just not believable enough as a character to make her storyline work, and her twin sister Kelly is just so bland and devoid of any personality that both of them are rendered kinda useless by the end. Sheriff Beasley is such a lame villain. If the death of his daughter had triggered the dark and aggressive part of his personality, and we had followed the descent of a good man into madness as he tries to make sense of his daughter's death and seek justice for her to the point where his vision of justice just turns into revenge, I would have been on board with him. That could have been an insanely fascinating storyline, but that's not really what we get. The show tells you from episode one that Sheriff Beasley is already a horrible person. He's abusive to his wife and to his daughters, he takes sexual favors from minors, and when it comes to his general demeanor, he's so overly villainous in every scene without an ounce of nuance that he comes across as a cartoon villain. So of course, we find out he was the one who sexually assaulted Angela Waters back in 1999 before she committed suicide. Was anybody surprised by that? He was the most obvious choice from the very first episode. Chip was way too much of a good guy to just be a likable character, so of course he turns out to be the one who sexually assaulted both Tabby and Imogen, making him the father of her baby. And then, about 0.5 seconds after it's revealed, A just awkwardly walks into frame and Imogen tells him Chip hurt them, so Chip gets murdered by A and it's never mentioned again because why have anything make sense? Honestly, most of the characters are not even worth mentioning. Even with the main ones, there is so little to say, especially when it comes to their interactions. These characters have no chemistry. They all work individually, except for her, she's the worst. But together, not really. Their bond feels extremely forced. The writing doesn't really support them on that level. Some people left comments on my post to tell me they think this cast feels more like friends than the original PLL, and um... What? I did criticize the original Pretty Little Liars by saying that despite the fact that most of these characters have a great sense of presence and charisma, I never bought the original Liars as best friends. I don't think I mentioned that in my PLL video, and I know that's a thing thousands of people have already talked about online, I'm not bringing anything new to the table here, but I never really bought into the friendship between Arya, Spencer, Hannah, and Emily. Which is odd, because Marlene constantly talked about how the show was about their unconditional friendship first and foremost, but it never really felt like that. The original Liars remind me a lot of The Avengers. I know I'm not alone in this, because people have talked about it online at length, but The Avengers never really felt like a family. They always felt like co-workers, and it's the same for Arya, Spencer, Hannah, and Emily. The writers really want you to believe they're so close, they're like a family. But no, it, it never feels like they are. They just feel like people who are brought together due to their circumstances and they get along and everything, but they never actually feel like best friends. That's just not what their dynamic is. But um, Original Sin is just as bad at it, and I don't understand why people say their friendship is more believable or genuine than the original show's liars. Like, really? These characters and their quote-unquote friendship feel so incredibly contrived. There's a scene in episode 4 where Imogen has a full-on meltdown over the suicide of her mother. Fuck you! 
and she screams that she's completely alone and has no one and she hates her mom for abandoning her. Then the other girls tell her she's not alone because she has them now and they're going to be best friends to the end. That's the phrase they use, friends to the end. And at first I was like, oh, this is kind of cute, girl power and shit. But it's also the moment I realized why their friendship feels so forced the whole time because that's the moment I realized, oh, these girls have known each other like a week. They actually don't know each other at all. They don't know anything about each other. The only reason they're brought together is because of A, and by extension Karen, but that's why their unconditional friendship doesn't work. It's not earned. It's not genuine. These girls met one random day in detention and they immediately become ride or die best friends. And it's just really hard to buy it. Again, they don't know anything about each other. They never really bond with when they get together, it's only to try and solve the A problem. So it feels incredibly disingenuous when the show then makes them act like they've been best friends for years. They do not know each other. They're strangers tied together by a serial killer. It does get better by the end of the season. It's slightly more believable, but it's still not quite there. We also don't get to see those characters do things together enough for them to feel like a gang. Tabby and Imogen do shit together, like when they go to Rosewood to meet a bootleg Eddie lamb at radley so that's probably why they're the only two that truly feel like friends but overall the liars are often just doing stuff on their own separately which leads to one of the biggest problems i have with this show useless filler storylines that go nowhere i'm not kidding there are so many scenes in this show that are here for no reason original sin is one of these shows that is full of moments that completely fall apart the moment you ask why? Why was that there? Or why did they do that? Because the writers don't really care about explaining things. Like, they just want shocking things to happen in the show. Not for any particular goal, not because it serves a story in any way, but just because it's shocking, and so they think it's cool. Tabby is, again, a great example of that. Throughout the season, Tabby is given so many hallucination sequences that I actually started to believe it was going to play a big part in her character's arc. In episode 7, she has a very vivid hallucination where she sees herself violently hurting someone out of anger and when she snaps out of it somebody makes it known that she phased out for a while and i was like oh what's this about like i was certain it was going somewhere and then later in the same episode tabby has another hallucination where she encounters a in the woods and he stabs her then she wakes up or snaps out of it and is genuinely confused it looks like she just woke from a dream and there was no reason for that to happen she wasn't even in the woods because of A, so why did that happen? I was so sure this was going to play a big part in her character moving forward, but no. It's never addressed, nothing ever comes out of it, and I realized that these scenes are only there because the writers are afraid that you're getting bored, so they just throw a random horror scene in the middle of the episode that has nothing to do with what is happening. This show doesn't make any sense. I swear, it happens so much. Actually, you know what? Let me show you exactly what I mean. Here's a list of useless plot points in Original Sin that go nowhere. Sheriff Beastly abusing underage kids. It never actually plays a part in the story, so why? Halfway through the season, the show tries to make you think Karen switched places with Kelly before getting murdered, which would mean Kelly was killed by A and Karen has been pretending to be her sister ever since. But then it just turns out it wasn't the case and Kelly was Kelly and Karen is just dead. So why? Mouse's entire storyline. Why? Six months before the start of the story, Imogen stole Tyler's phone after she caught him filming a clearly drunk Karen at a party. She had his phone in her possession for six months. You'd think he'd ask for it back, by the way, but anyway, whatever. And then Tyler was murdered by A at the end of episode five. It seemed like the show was setting up Imogen to become a suspect for being in possession of the phone of a recent murder victim. But then nothing comes of it. It's shrugged off and Tyler's death is never really mentioned, so why? Davey commits suicide in episode one, then the show spends a massive amount of time making Imogen try to prove that her suicide was not a suicide, but a murder disguised as a suicide, only for the show to go back in the finale and just be like, nah, it was a suicide. And I ask again, 
Why? Farron's father gets arrested in episode 9. It's a huge fucking deal. The show treats it like something really bad is about to happen. It's a big cliffhanger type moment. But then, at the very start of episode 10, Farron goes home and her dad is just there. He's fine. Absolutely nothing happened to him. He was just randomly arrested for no reason and then released thanks to Farron's mom and there is no point to any of it. So... Why? The end of episode 3 shows the girls coming face to face with A for the very first time alone in a cemetery. The cliffhanger suggests a confrontation is about to happen, it's a big scene, and then the next episode starts and it's the next day and the girls are just hanging out at school. And that scene from episode 3 is never brought up or discussed. Nothing. It's never mentioned again. But like, he was right in front of you. What happened? It's never mentioned again, so why? I could go on forever with this, by the way. It's very common to Roberto's shows. Like, things just kind of randomly happen in them just because. And he doesn't really care if it has anything to do with the story. That's like his thing, and I don't really understand it. And because of that, I think there's one particular thing about Original Sin that would fix a lot of its issues. And that thing is... Pretty Little Liar's Original Sin should have been a movie. There is absolutely no reason why such a small-scale slasher mystery needed 10 hours to be told. This literally could have been a two-hour movie and it would have made it a million times better. This show fucking drags. For no reason. It has terrible pacing. Things that shouldn't even be here take a massive portion of the show and then plot points that need more time to be fleshed out are completely glossed over and rushed in a way that feels completely unnatural. There's so many plot points where I was like, all of this could have been condensed and it would have been a million times better. Like episodes one to three could have been condensed into one episode. The arc of all three of these episodes kind of equate to the first episode of the original show. The pilot of the original PLL is really effective. It's simple and it moves fast enough to keep the intrigue mind boggling. It establishes everything really well and it doesn't give you time to get bored. The the true kickoff point of the present day mystery and original sin is the murder of Karen Beasley, which is at the end of the second episode. It could have been sped up so easily if the show wasn't so concerned with setting up pointless storylines for half of the runtime. This show wastes your time so much and it doesn't have a consistent identity. And ultimately, the big question I have with original sin is a pretty obvious one. Who is this show for? It might sound familiar because it's a question I asked for both Riverdale and Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, and it's overall a massive issue with every single one of Roberto Aguirre-Sacasa's project. It's like he has no idea who his audience is. His shows often seem like they're made for young children, like 8 to 10 years old. You get those incredibly cheesy sequences that are right out of a Disney Channel movie for kids. <laughs> a bowling date with Ash. Ah. <gasps> oh my god, he's like a teen Cole Sprouse. <laughs> I am so shipping this. Mash needs to be canon. Like the way it's directed, the dialogue, it all looks like it's made for young kids. But also, it can't possibly be made for kids because this show deals with murder, sexual assault, and drug addiction, and it's bloody as fuck. This show doesn't have a set identity, and it's the same for every single one of Roberto's projects. Anyways, I could keep going for hours, there's so much more to say, but this video is already way longer than I intended for it to be. However, I cannot truly talk about Original Sin without talking about the ending. Ooh, you come and get it. Uh, too far, yeah, but I scan it. Neon West, you can understand it. The ending of Pretty Little Liars Original Sin is a whole mess. The last three episodes of the show are like the final arc, but it's really bizarre. Most of it doesn't even have to do with A and the whole mystery. It's mostly dedicated to wrapping up the filler storylines each character goes through. So Farron and her scoliosis, Noah and her mom's drug addiction, Tabby and Imogen's assault storyline with Chip, and Mouse's whole thing with the man and his missing daughter. It's around that time I realized that very little of this show is actually 
really what's considered to be the main story. It's really boring. Episodes 8 and 9 were a real pain in the ass to get through. I hated these episodes so much. Anyways, eventually the finale is finally like, hey, I should probably wrap up the story this show is supposed to mainly be about. Once all of these subplots are wrapped up, the girls' moms are kidnapped by A because Farron told Kelly about A, which broke the rule A established when he killed Karen in episode 2. The moms are then brought to the high school gym, where they're being held hostage by A and the mastermind behind all of this. And this is where we are introduced to the most underwhelming and uninteresting twist I have ever seen. And I'm not saying that lightly. This honestly might have been my least favorite twist in any of these shows. Are you guys ready? Because I swear to you, everything I'm about to say is 100% real. This is what actually happens in the show. Buckle up. So, the big reveal of the season is that the A we have been seeing this whole time is not actually the mastermind. He's just an executioner who kills for the actual person behind all this. The high school's principal. <sighs> Again? I'm not kidding. This character, who has only been in this show in fleeting sequences, who has had zero ties to the story up until 24 minutes into the finale, turns out to be the big bad. And it turns out that the principal is the secret father of Angela Waters, and he wants revenge for what happened to her in 1999. But that's not it. It also turns out that A, the serial killer that's been going around and murdering bullies this whole time. He's the principal's secret son and Angela Waters' secret brother. And the reason why he wears a mask is because his face is apparently completely deformed. They refer to it as a face only a mother could love, which... Ouch. But the cherry on top, the part that truly had me waving the white flag, is the reveal that the reason why A is called A is because his real name is Archie. Why are you like this? Why? What did we do to you? Just in case you forgot, by the way, Roberto is also developing a True Blood reboot right now because somehow Warner Brothers just keeps handing him massive properties on a silver platter. So if you happen to like True Blood, um, I'm very sorry for what's about to happen to it. So yeah, to summarize, basically the twist villain of Original Sin is a character that nobody really knows and a character that nobody really has a connection to not even the girl's moms so like why why are we supposed to care this show builds up to the twist villain who's literally just some guy who lives in town it's the lamest mystery ever what the fuck was that decision oh oh but wait we're, we're not done no 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 there is more so after that lame ass reveal we need to have a big climax and what is that climax well a and his daddy decide to completely abandon their code because again Again, why make anything make sense? Basically, they want revenge on Imogen's mom, Davy, for making Angela Waters kill herself. You would think that Davy taking her own life in the pilot would achieve that because A only kills bullies, but instead, they decide to completely abandon their code. The principal just randomly decides that the sins of the mother now have to be paid by the daughter, and he sends A after Imogen to kill her. <laughs> Yo! Yo, I'm sorry. This finale is just so stupid. First of all, this goes against everything that has been established for Ace philosophy. The show literally builds an entire set of circumstances leading up to the finale, and then when the finale arrives, those circumstances are immediately thrown out the window and nothing actually matters. Fantastic. So the principal sends A to kill Imogen, but because Imogen is pregnant, he decides 
decides to give her a head start to give her a chance to potentially survive. Why does he do that? Who cares? This show was written by Roberto. It's not gonna make sense and you just have to accept that. But here's where I finally lost it. This is the moment where I just stopped believing this show was real. Remember earlier when I said Imogen is supposed to be a smart character, but she always makes the dumbest decisions? Well, this is truly the example for you. After the principal gives her the head start to run before A comes after her, Imogen immediately exits the school. She starts running and running, and I assumed she was going to the police station, because obviously. But no, 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 that, that, would, be, that would be too easy. That would be smart. That would be the normal thing to do, so that's not what she does. Instead of going to the police station, or like to somebody's house, or a crowded public space, you know, anywhere with people, Imogen decides to run and hide in her mother's abandoned house. She decides to go to an isolated house that has been vacant for months, the one place where nobody would possibly find her or hear her scream or anything. She's like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is my best shot. I'll go there. And I shit you not. She decides to go there because of a memory she has with her mom where her mom told her their house would always be her safe place. <sighs> Why are you like this? We never did anything to you! So she goes there and obviously A immediately finds her and beats the shit out of her. She gets a bit of a badass moment where she decides to fight back and they knock each other out. That was admittedly pretty cool. And then Imogen's waters break during the fight. Oh yeah, uh, in case you forgot, Imogen is nine months pregnant. It never seems like it because it's like never a thing that seems to bother her even when she's running away from A or fighting him, she's like totally fine. And she gives birth while unconscious, and she wakes up in the hospital. A is in the hospital too, he survived, so did Sheriff Beasley. Oh yeah, while well, everything was happening, Sheriff Beasley was stabbed by his wife, it's not important. And the principal was arrested after being KO'd by the least believable hit of all time. Tom Beasley will get his. Oh, he got his. Oh, holy shit, Kelly! <laughs> Bro, what is going on? And then the final cliffhanger of the season is A waking up in the hospital and murdering a bunch of people and so I guess nothing actually changed then. Nothing was really resolved and A is still on the loose. And that's that. Pretty Little Liars Original Sin ends with the most half-assed anticlimactic finale I have seen in quite a while. At the time of making this video, the show still hasn't been picked up for a season two. It also hasn't been canceled, but it looks like its fate is very much up in the air. And the thing with Roberto's shows is that their first seasons are usually the best ones. It always goes downhill after that because as soon as he done one thing that works, they give him too much power and he drives it into the ground. Season 1 of Riverdale is quite alright and season 1 of Sabrina is kind of okay. We don't need to talk about Katie Kane. So genuinely, if this season is the best original Sin has to offer? Oh boy, that's depressing. I saw somebody online referring to original Sin as soulless, and I think that is a perfect way to describe this reboot. It is devoid of anything genuine. It is so bland and fake from start to finish. It's so concerned with shoving endless hypocritical social justice down your throat the whole time that it kind of forgets it's supposed to be telling a story. And knowing Roberta so season two onwards is gonna be a descent into madness that can only be stopped if the show gets cancelled. There's absolutely no hope here. Especially because he's established now that this show exists in the same universe as Riverdale. And some people have sent me this interview where Roberto promises Original Sin and Riverdale will never cross over, even if they're part of the same universe. They sent it to me like, look at this, it's important. He says there will never be a crossover, so like maybe this show will be fine. Okay, yeah. Yeah, um... I don't believe him. I'm sorry, you can't believe anything this guy says. Like, 
at all. In case you forgot, back in 2018, Lily Reinhardt did an interview where she talked about the direction Riverdale was going in season 3. She explained that she was worried the show was going into supernatural territory with the Gargoyle King, the cults, and the rituals. And she asked Roberto if the show was going to deal with magic, and Roberto apparently promised her that magic would never be a part of the show. Despite the craziness, he believes Riverdale is grounded in a certain sense of reality. He swore there would be no magic. Let me just remind you that Riverdale just closed its sixth season with a storyline involving witches, parallel universes, the devil, a magic comet, and a twist ending that includes literal time travel. So, you know what? I don't give a shit what Roberto said. I don't believe him. Roberto has proven on multiple occasions that he just kinda says things in interviews, and he has a habit of not really sticking to any of it. You just can't take him at his word. If tomorrow he's tempted to make a PLL Riverdale crossover, even if it doesn't make any sense and would ruin everything that holds original sin in its own bubble. He will do it in a heartbeat and he won't think about it twice. Hell, he might even make it a musical. You think this guy gives a shit? Look at him. You think he gives a shit? I just don't understand why this show was made. I mean, obviously it wasn't made out of passion. It was made because HBO Max wants more people on their streaming service, so they capitalized on a known property. But like, when you look at the actual show that was made, I just... I don't understand. I don't get why it had to be like this. And I feel like I should be more pissed off about this show, but I'm not. There was no hope for it. The second it was announced that Roberto had signed on as showrunner, I knew it was dead. This wasn't a disappointment more than it was just a confirmation of what I was expecting. Between HBO Max's handling of Gossip Girl and Sex in the City, plus Roberto being Roberto, there was no scenario in which this show was going to be good. It was dead on arrival, and I knew it. I just I think it's unfortunate because, without a doubt, this will turn out to be the final nail in the coffin for Pretty Little Liars. This franchise will now eternally be carried by the memory of a rapidly aging show that once captivated audiences like a decade ago. And I think it goes without saying that if Original Sin gets renewed for a second season, I will not be watching it. I also think it's too bad that shows like this have become the standard for American teen television. Like, the bar is so low, the bar is literally on the ground. These weird shows with empty characters, with stories that hardly make any sense, with scripts that quite literally treat the audience like idiots, they somehow became the popular shows now, like people are eating them up. Genuinely, before I got a chance to watch this show, I got DMs from people telling me it was the best show of the year and that it was a million times better than the original show and i'm just uh, the bar is on the ground hashtag justice for noah she's too good for this show oh you come and get it uh, too far yeah but i scan it neon west you can understand it weak boys will get offended uh, you're staring